When we were in the Mennonite church in Heston, Kansas, we sang this song. One gentleman really preferred this song. I like this song. It's true. But anyway,
Starting a new study on the book of Ephesians. And many, many say that this particular book is one of the richest books as it pertains to doctrine. As a matter of fact, the first three chapters are all about doctrine, and then the last three are what we do with what we've been taught. And um, I'm going about. I'm I'm with, with Pastor Ken. I want to be thorough, without being too over thorough, and keep everybody's interest. And but yet at the same time go deep enough to challenge you to think a little bit differently. And that's it's a challenge, but it's not impossible. And so, oops. So y'all ready? Do I need to sit closer to you now? <laughs> I, you know, honey, I, you know, it's going to take me a while to get my sea legs back because I haven't been out five weeks. But it was a good five weeks off. And we finished on a good note in Genesis and now we're in Ephesians. So are you guys ready? Are you ready for the special speaker of the evening? <laughs> are you? Okay, well, here we go then. Well, I appreciate that, but this but this guy has got something on me. You got Jesus to read this? I did. <laughs> as soon as I can. I bet he got word. done. Oh, the battery's dead. So hit it. The Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Ephesians, chapter one. Paul. An apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance 
until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Well, that's a heavy thing to start right off, isn't it? I mean, there's so much in that that, I mean, you know, you you can spend a long time. Uh, I've been studying for this since pretty much uh, about six or eight weeks before we ended the... Uh, Genesis study, so I've been in it in it a while, um, and there's so much. I mean, even in this first chapter, uh, one of the sources I use is a gentleman by the name of Pastor Chuck, the late Pastor Chuck Smith, and in his in-depth commentary of Ephesians, there was, if I remember right, something like 48 different lessons in all six chapters of of Ephesians. So, I mean, we can go. I mean, we can really pound this thing to you know where. Um, also, uh, a lot of material I've given is from a, uh, the late Chuck Missler, uh, who, uh, of course, is very well known and a very deep thinker, and also Pastor Tommy Heigl. Um, he's the main author of, of where I'm going with this, uh, to try to make it simple, but yet at the same time deep enough that challenges us. Also, um, my wife Kimberly is studying along with me on this, and she will fill in the gaps that I miss. And so, um, this is something that the Lord directed her to do. And since we are a team, uh, she'll be able to fill in some things that I might miss. And so, um, with that, let's begin. So, in Pico's, Pico's County... In West Texas, there's a famous oil field known as the Yates Pool. Now, during the Depression, uh, the oil field was a sheep ranch owned by a man by the name of Yates. All right, Mr. Yates wasn't able to make enough money ranching to pay his mortgage and was in danger of losing his ranch. Then, in the year 1926, an oil company asked Mr. Yates permission to drill a wildcat well on his ranch, and he signed a lease for it. Now, I don't understand any how they do that, but anyway... The first well brought 80,000 barrels a day, and some subsequent wells at more than twice that. Yeah, and Mr. Yates, he owned it all, but yet he was living in poverty. He owned it, but he didn't possess it. And he's like many Christians today who have untold spiritual riches that don't possess them. Does that sound like something we talked about a little bit Thursday, Rick? Just a, just a little bit? Um, more than any other book in, in, in the Bible, Ephesians tells us how to possess uh, the spiritual riches that are a result of living a spirit-filled life. All right? Now, this is something that takes, it takes time. And all of us in this room tonight, for the most part, are pretty much seasoned Veterans. In other words, we've been around a while. And we're also aware enough where we 
aren't going to say, oh, well, we've got this. Because the more we say that, what happens? God goes, watch this. <laughs> and, and so, um, to begin to live a spiritual life, it requires three things. And we're basically going to be in the first six verses tonight in Scripture. But the first thing is, we need to remember who we are. All right? Paul begins the epistle. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Since Paul is an apostle by the will of God, he's not writing this epistle by um, the will of man or his own will, but by God's will. All right, now that may be hard um, for some of us to understand. I've heard recently... Some people would some people say to be an apostle, and this Chuck Smith said this too, he says if you call yourself an apostle, you would have had to have been with Jesus or have seen Jesus himself. Now there are various opinions on that, and honestly it's not worth arguing. I tend to I tend to want to believe that because if you've got to have a title in front of your name that it's all about the title and not about the author who gave you that. And so, um, I was telling Rick, uh, I've been kind of looking at some prophecy things for 2024, and a lot of them are way out there. But the, the but the three that I did watch pretty much said the same thing, and then I, that's not what this is about. But I watched one, and this guy said, well, I am prophet so-and-so, and I'm like, nope. Because, because pride is a terrible thing. And Paul, to know Paul's story, Paul was a Pharisee. I mean, he, he had been trained by the best of the best. He, had a, he was from a wealthy family. I mean, he was all that in a bag of chips. And he's on his road, on his way to Damascus, and God goes, boom, watch this. And his life changed pretty much forever at that point. So when Paul writes something, he writes it one from experience, but more importantly, he writes it from the fact that this is who I was and this is who I am and this is what God is doing. And, and so basically he's sharing a testimony of his walk all throughout these scriptures. And so... Um, He's writing this epistle to the to the Ephesian church, and we're going to find out where this is here in just a little bit. But we need to remember as we study um, this epistle, we need to remember this fact found in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, where it says, Every scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So if you bring your Bible and you open it up in the original form, all right, that, it, that God had, had it written, it's inspired by God. Now we do have man interpreting a lot, uh, putting it in English, and sometimes we can mess it up a little bit, all right? But the original intent was... It was God-breathed, okay? And so, but here's what it says. It's for teaching. In other words, for showing us what to do. For reproof, for showing us not what to do. Uh, for correction, so we don't do what we weren't supposed to do again. And uh, to, to instruct in righteousness, so we don't even think about doing it again. All right, now, I don't think I'll be able to repeat that, but it is on Facebook and, and, and eventually. Uh, but but it's so true. But with that, when you look at verse 17, that the man of God or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. In other words, the Holy Spirit will not ask you to do anything that He first does not equip you to do. Okay? So... Um, Remember, we do have an enemy out there who can clothe himself as light. He, he can make himself look religious. Uh, he can even use he can even use someone like Pastor Ken, and this is just an example, to say you need to do this or you need to do that. And if and if you're not equipped for it, 
Or if the Holy Spirit puts a red flag in front of your face, then you need to think about this a little bit and seek God first. Because, you know, like I said, religious people do, religious leaders do this all the time. That's why, you know, we're held, Pastor Ken and I are held uh, doubly, we're held to a double accountability for what we teach. Now, we may teach a little differently, but the thing about it is, the goal is the same, and that's to, to glorify Jesus Christ. And, and, that's, and that's the difference, honestly. So, uh, saying that, remember, it's when you're reading the Scriptures, it's the Holy Spirit Himself, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, speaking to us through this epistle. Alright, so, it's not one man's opinion, it's the Holy Spirit showing us the way that we need to go. And that's very important. So, uh, Paul writes this letter while he's a prisoner in Rome. And he tells you that in Ephesians chapter 3. More than likely, this was written around the year 60 A.D. And then during this first imprisonment, he also wrote uh, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Or Philemon, whichever you want to call it. Uh, now, during Paul's third missionary journey... Uh, he had a tremendous three-year ministry in Ephesus. As a matter of fact, uh, this was the only time, this was the longest Paul stayed in any one place, was three years. Now, when we read the scriptures, when you read the book of Acts, where uh, it gives you basically Paul's life to a certain point, it, it looks like, and this day Paul did this, and then the next day he did that. Well, no, uh, because remember, they didn't have cars. So if he was going to go to say to Ephesus, you know, to say Ephesus to Thessalonica, it was it was a several day journey, you know, sometimes up to a month or more. So you know, it just doesn't happen overnight. And along the way, let's face it, uh, hopefully you learned something today that you didn't know yesterday, and you learned something yesterday that you didn't know two days ago, and so on and so forth. So Paul's life was a learning journey, and we we are privileged. Uh, through the Holy Spirit to see the marvelous things that, that God allowed Paul to do. Now, Paul, because he was very intense, and uh, he knew later that the church would face serious problems from false teachers. Paul, Paul part of Paul's... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Part of Paul's marvelousness, I guess. I don't know quite the word I'm looking at. But right after he had his uh, conversion experience, when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he got to go to Arabia for three years and be trained by Jesus himself. How that happened, we don't know because Paul didn't say. He just says, I went to Arabia, spent three years with Jesus. Wow. That's all we know, right? How cool would that be for us to do that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he spent three years with other disciples. Too. Yeah. I, I didn't think about that. That's pretty cool. Did you hear that? Dave says, it's interesting. He spent three years with the other disciples, and he spent three years with Peter, too. Or with Paul, too. Isn't that, that's cool. That's, that's an interesting point. So anyway, when you look at... When you look at some of the last chapters of Acts, he calls the, the Ephesian elders to go meet him like 30 miles away from Ephesus. And uh, he, tells, he tells the Ephesus leaders this in uh, Acts 20, verse 29, where it says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you and not spare the flock. And these elders took it seriously. If you look in the book of Revelation to the church in Ephesus, one of the things that Jesus said that they did that they did well was they guarded against false doctrine. The problem was it, it became all about guarding against the false doctrine, and they lost their first love. And the church of Ephesus is no more as a result. So we've got to be careful and always maintain, strive to have fellowship with our Lord and Savior. Correct? Amen. All right, now... Let's take a look a little bit here at Ephesus. 
All right. The, the epistle was written to the saints which are in Ephesus. All right. Now, Ephesus was the capital of proconsular Asia, only second to Rome. So basically, it's, it's in Turkey, but we have to remember, all right, the Roman Empire at that time, there was an eastern leg and a western leg of the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, um, the eastern leg outlasted the western leg by over a thousand years. All right? And so um, it was basically, it was like, it was the, it would be like, okay, when we think of like uh, two major cities, we, the first thing we think of is either uh, New York and L.A., correct? And even though basically, you know, the first thing we always think of is New York first, and then L.A. second. Both of them are crappy, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. Us old folks, that's what we think, all right? <clears throat> Ephesus was like, was like L.A. I mean, it was, it was like the second capital, and they were going to put the capital there one time, if I remember right. All right, it was consecrated to uh, Artemis, and uh, it was colonized mainly uh, from Athens, all right, so the Greeks, they were, they were into philosophy. They also were into, uh, you know, party hardy because you can die tomorrow. You know, that, that was their philosophy. They did not believe in the afterlife, so it was like, this is, this is it. Have fun because you're going to die and it's going to be all over. Boy, were they surprised. But anyway, um, a lot of great painters of that day came from, from uh, Ephesus. Uh, Parisus and Apelles, they were Ephesians. Uh, Pythagoras is said to have come from Ephesus, and I think he was a mathematician, but don't, don't, you know, don't quote me on that, because I'm not... Pythagorean theory. Okay. All right. Like I said, that's, you know, um, but there were schools from Par Par Parmenides, Parmenides, Zeno, and Democritus there. All right. Um, so... You know, there, it, it, was a, it was a great seat of education at one time. It also, at one time, had this huge harbor. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a, basically, it was a city of commerce. But, all right, there was a river there um, called Caster, the Caster River, and it eventually, so much silt went into this harbor that it basically made it useless towards the end of, of the life of the city, okay? Um, now, one of the seven wonders of the world was there, uh, and that's what they think it looked like um, when it was built. And then there's the ruins of it. There it is a it is a the Temple of Artemis or the Temple of Diana. Now this thing took 220 years to build. They 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 certainly didn't have those cranes and and you know hey guess what though Rick they didn't they didn't have to uh, get inspected every every 30 seconds to get it to get it done right too so you know we we we've talked about that hotel quite a bit so i'm just kind of just kind of letting them know that hey you know it, it was okay but anyway this thing uh in its heyday was 100 418 feet by 239 feet this thing's huge all right uh it had 127 56 foot columns it was four times larger than the Parthenon, and it stood until the year 262 A.D. when the Goths basically destroyed it. So, I mean, even the even when you look at you know this thing now, if you ever get to go there, it's a it, they say it's an amazing amazing sight to look at. One thing else that they did is pretty cool. You can see this. Um, they excavated this theater on the west side of Mount Corsius. And it was, at the time, the largest theater in the Hellenistic world. It held 50,000. Now, a good baseball stadium holds maybe 50, 60,000 people. So, I mean, you, you can kind of see maybe that's where they got baseball from. I'm just kidding, but I don't know. But apparently, can you imagine, even though they were all around they, the, the acoustics of this place, because they didn't have microphones and amplifiers and all this other stuff, but yet they did plays there, and, and this was a place where politicians would go and uh, and you know do their politicking, and you know the great philosophers would would expound their their blah 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 to fifty thousand at a time. So I mean, this is something else. All right, 
Um, there's also several several uh, uh, figurative references to, to Ephesus in First Corinthians, and also uh, in the book of Revelation. Also, uh, the earliest New Testament allusion to it was the pious Jews at Pentecost in Acts two nine. They talk about Ephesus. So uh, remember, Paul stayed there at least three years longer than anybody else. And the gospel may have been more effective in this area than any other time, any other place, or time in the history of the world. Remember, it was a seaport. I mean, it was it had a harbor. There was a lot of commerce. People would go in and out. If it if it at its heyday had three hundred thousand people that didn't have YouTube or MTV or any of this other stuff, you know that. Right, exactly. And since Paul was there for three years, he was well known. Um, Paul was not shy. Um, you know, he didn't pretty much. You know, he wanted people to be saved. He pretty much didn't care what anybody else thought. And so he he became quite popular and quite unpopular. <clears throat> but there's a good hub for it to be spread from. Right, right. Um, if I remember right, uh, Laodicea is fairly close to Ephesus. Um, but I, could, I could be wrong there. It's just coming off the top of my head. But there was like three major cities, like real close. But Ephesus was the big one. You, you, could, you could kind of put it like, you know, Cape, Scott City, and Jackson, right? You know, where it's kind of a hub area. Actually, we have Ephesus, Smyrna, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, all in like an arc. Around Ephesus. Okay, so you it's heard, a you heard. Ways away. Yeah, so I mean, all these major cities, a lot of them that we see in uh, the book of Revelation when Jesus writes to those churches, were all in this area, real close. So it, it gives you an idea of the the central area. And how the fact that the gospel could have easily spread from this place. And so, since it was big, um, more than likely, uh, the church there in Ephesus was probably a pretty good size. We don't know mm -hmm. how big it was. Um, but it was influential, even, even in a greek center culture. So, it, it just, you know... What I'm trying to do is trying to give everybody an idea of, and you've heard me say this before, times change, people don't. <clears throat> right? Amen. So, uh, when we, you know, with the age of the internet now, we have more influence than we ever have for the gospel. Are we using it? Now, I realize there's a bunch of other garbage out there that we're quote unquote competing with, but remember, God does not have to compete with anyone. So that's kind of cool. What he was walking into and up against. Yeah. Uh, all the philosophies and all the stuff that was getting shared there. Uh, and here the Jews that just lost all pretty much influence whatsoever. The power of God was really not being demonstrated within them for years. Yeah. And then he's walking in the middle of nowhere preaching an entirely different message than anybody ever a form a former Pharisee at that a former a former Jew so yeah it that they, it definitely it definitely almost uh, like it was planned huh? <laughs> almost like it was planned you yeah, think maybe all right <clears throat> now the word translated saints all right remember it says to the saints in Ephesus correct um, but okay let's go back to Ephesus one more time all right now uh, there is, there is a small village. There in Turkey, where you can still see the, the ruins of the Temple of Diana, but it's pretty much a wasteland now. From 300,000 to just a few hundred people. A tourist town. So the, the word translated saints means holy ones or separated ones. And it refers to those who have separated themselves from the world to be used by God. And saints are people who are in Christ Jesus. Notice, in Christ Jesus. I want you to, to hold, to, hold to that word. All right, in Christ.
Christ Jesus. Now, we may live physically in other places. You know, some of us live here in Scott City, some of us live in Cape, uh, some of us live in Jackson. But as believers, we're, we should be all spiritually in one place. That place is in Christ Amen. Jesus. Amen. That's it. All right. That's it. Doesn't matter whether you're Baptist, Pentecostal, <clears throat> Lutheran, if you're a believer, all of us are in Christ if He is our Lord. All right. And that word, that phrase, in Christ, is found over 18, 80, excuse me, 80 times in the New Testament. Uh, also 14 times uh, in the book of Ephesians. All right. Uh, also, the phrase in Him referring to Christ is found eight times for a total of, total of 22 times uh, in the book of Ephesians. Now, Chuck Missler says it's in the book of Ephesians 27 times. Now, if you add, you know, <coughs> there's five times in there between the two. Is it worth arguing over? No. The point is, in Christ is a lot. I think it's important. You think? Oh, yeah. I think. All right. So every Christian may say, every Christian, every true believer in Jesus is a saint, a separated one. All right? And you, But you may say, you may say, but I don't feel like a saint. All of us have been there. All of us. If that's you... You need to understand what the phrase what the phrase in Christ Jesus means. 2 Corinthians 5 21, it explains it a little bit. He made the one who knew no sin to become a sin offering on our behalf, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. In him, in him we are made righteous. Thank Not of ourselves, because we can. Thank you, Lord. We can. Thank you, Lord. Exactly. <clears throat> now, this statement from Tommy Heigl, I, I have struggled with in the past. All right. God only sees us in Christ's righteousness, according to the Scripture. I believe that. I do too, but it took me a while. Yeah, it's, it's, because it's, it's a tough one. It is a tough one because, all right, remember, we have an enemy out there who wants to make us feel like we are unworthy. Yeah. Now, in reality, we are unworthy. Right. But because of his blood, yeah. we have been made worthy. That's right. Yeah. Whether we feel like it or not. All right. Woo! Now, here at Father, you know, have you ever gone to church wearing no clothes? <laughs> now, here at Father's Arms, we do not care what you wear. Just wear clothes. Okay, just wear something. Okay? You know, we are not... Yeah, that is a good... Especially tonight, it's, that's a very good idea. I guess an air raid won't work. Yeah. But, you know... We've all been, for those of us that have been in the faith a while, we've all been to those places where they expect us to dress a certain way and look a certain way. And I can remember at seminary, I can remember at seminary in my preaching class <clears throat> with a bunch of guys I hung out with every day, when we had to preach, we had to dress up. Mm -hmm. And I just I, I I struggled with that for a while because I remember one time I remember one time when I was first when I first got called into the ministry when I first got called into the ministry and I was still cutting hair at J.C. Penney's I used to cut this businessman's hair and of course I told him you know that I'm going you know to seminary to go in I I got I got to go do good things and. And uh, he said, and he said to me, he says, "Oh, you're going to be a man of the cloth." And me being a smart aleck goes, "No, I'm going to be the man in the Armani suit." I lost him as a client that day. Wow. And it made me think. 
because I mean that's when Benny Hinn was really going good and all these um, TV ministers wearing these three thousand dollar suits and all this other stuff and a lot of guys were really wanting to be like them and I have to admit I thought that was pretty cool too till I realized that I hate suits I have a choking I have a choking reflex if I put a tie around my neck I feel like I'm choking. But yet I wanted to be like that. And I learned a valuable, valuable lesson that day. Because the thing about it is, that's not the people who, who I was most effective reaching. The most effective people that Kim and I have ever reached were people just like us. You know, just, just goobers. You know, sometimes with a dirty house, dishes stacked high to the ceiling. You know, uh, deal, dealing with a special needs child and just our own stupidity, you know, just like 99% of America. And those are the people that we reach, you know. And I, I don't have a problem anymore with people if they want to wear a suit. But, you know, like I said, you know, we don't care what kind of clothes you wear here, just wear clothes, something, please. You know? In Christ, all right, in Christ, God only sees us in the spiritual clothes of his righteousness, praise God. And Galatians 3.27 expresses this really cool. For all of you who were immersed in Messiah have clothed yourselves with Messiah. Oh, bless the Lord. When we receive Jesus as our Savior, we're spiritually baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. And there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's our baptism when we become Christians. All right. I think there's two things. Some people would say different. It's not a big argument point. Honestly, it, it really isn't. The, the, the scripture says, for by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. Now, we're one body. Some of our body speaks in tongues. Some of our body does not. All right. Some of our, some of our body is very liturgical. In, in their methods of, of preaching, some of us are not. But we're still in the same body. And if we would realize that, there would be nearly the competition, but we'd be in unity. And, and that's just something that I just, that, I, str I struggle with that competition because I, I, boy, I got force fed into that when I was, when I was preaching in Greenview. You know, I mean, it was just like you you get these reports of all these churches having these wonderful events, yet the little guys out there who are doing the very same thing, it just didn't matter. And I'm just like, wait a minute. It's true. But then I go back to, I go back to the scripture where it says, you know, Jesus, when did we feed you? When did we clothe you? When did we give you orders? Yeah, when you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me also. Hallelujah. And that was very comforting to me. Yes, it is. All right. Now, God only sees us as believers dressed in spiritual clothes, and those clothes are the righteousness of Christ. All right. That means that's what it means to be in Christ or to be saints. We are clothed in His righteousness. Everyone who believes in Him gets the same. Thing. There's, you know, Dave didn't get, you know, he doesn't get gold colors, gold color, you know, clothes of righteousness, and Nancy doesn't get silver. We all get the same, and they're gods, and it's more valuable than any of that stuff is anyway. Amen. All right. Now, when Paul opens up the scriptures, there he says, uh, "Grace and peace." He is the only one. Peter uses it once, I think, but when when you look at Paul's letters. Especially at the end, it's always made the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Grace and peace. That was his deal. That was Paul's deal. That's why you can look at the that's why you can pretty much tell the writings of Paul because of, of that key phrase, all right. He goes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We can just quit right there. In Christ. No, no, In Christ, no, no, no. but we're not. All right. You know what that means? 
Here's what it means. It means God will not hold, withhold any blessing in heaven from those who are in Christ. So the thing about it is, me and Rick get the same blessings in Christ. Me and Kenny get the same blessings in Christ. That's, that's cool. But how do we appropriate all spiritual blessings God wants to give us? Now, God tells Joshua to go and possess the promised land he has already given to the Israelites. Here's what he tells Joshua in Joshua 1.3. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I've given to you, so as I spoke to Moses. Or as I spoke to Moses. <coughs> now, Joshua and the Israelites had to do their part to receive the promised blessing. And so must we. We need to do our part. Alright? Blessings are conditional. Okay? Now, it's not works based. You can't work your way to blessings. You can't work your way to heaven. They are free gifts from God. Okay? But, we need to we need to do our part. We need to pray. We need to, we need to study His Word. We need to give. Yes, we need to give. That's a spiritual blessing. We can't outgive God. And isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? The more we give, the more God gives back. Oh, hallelujah! Now, if you're in it for if you're in it for the getting. You're going to be disappointed. But if you do it because you know you can't outgive God and He always blesses you in the most unique, amazing ways, and you want to see somebody else blessed like you are, watch out because the blessings are going to come like you wouldn't believe. You got something to say, don't you? Okay. So you're talking about give, you know, give, give, give. What if you're enabling somebody? You're giving and giving and giving, but yet they're not doing their part. <clears throat> well, then you have the opportunity to say, I'm done. To give okay. discipline. Yeah. Uh, 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 to, give, to give discipline. To give tough okay. love. Yeah. Tough love. Huh? Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there, okay. there, there comes a time. There are limits, yeah. There, there, there are limits. There comes a time. But the question is, are you giving to God or are you giving to them? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? If you're giving to God, that's going to be blessed. Yep. If you're if you're given to them, whoever it is, for whatever the reason is, and there's no results, you have every right to say, nope, that's it. We're done. Okay. We're done. It's unhealthy. Yeah. It's unhealthy. And they won't ever learn. No. Yep. You know, that's my like, problem. They never learn. When you give and it's the Holy Spirit, you have peace inside. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. There, there is when, some. When you give and, and, and the, you are in that situation of enabling, the Holy Spirit just creates you in here, and you and it's you can tell by what's right in here that that's not right. So, like yeah. when you give your time and you feel good about giving whatever it is you <clears throat> give, that's good. But when I like give to my son, if he just takes and takes and takes, that's not good. No, no. I feel like the spirit's grieved over it. You know? Yeah, if it's if it's grieving you on the inside, yeah, yeah, yeah it's time it's time to change some just things. Back off, really you know? bad. One yep. parent I know said they said to their kids, we were, you know, didn't it was unnecessary stuff too. And they said, "Hey, I'm not your source. God's your source." Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know how. Well, then it's time for you to learn how to get in touch with God. And you need to be, God's your source, not me. I won't be here all the time. And you're going to have a husband here pretty quick who's who's going to be able to help you with that too. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Yeah. That's, a, that's a big area. Spot and say, 
Christians are nice. Jesus is nice. You're not being nice. I don't feel the love. But what it is, is you're finding the truth. They don't. They didn't want the truth. They just wanted the, the goodies. We love to give, but we got to we got to make sure it lines up with what the Holy Spirit is saying. Exactly, exactly. For people who take, I find in just with what I do, I don't mind giving if somebody needs something and I've been criticized. People come in and they need, you know, money for gas or whatever. Well, they're supposed to go to the police station because we have cards to give them. But sometimes there's not time for that or the Lord moves you to do something. And I've gotten in trouble with a couple. Don't do that because they're just going to, they're going to be in here every day expecting you to do something for them. And for the most part, they are not. I've given once, they're gracious. And, you know, if I do see them again, they're just very kind. I'll say, there are on occasions when those people see an opportunity, oh, well, they're just going to be a bank for me, you know. That is where you really have to see where the Lord is leading you because if it is somebody who's truly in need, you know, and they don't know what to do, you know, a mom with, you know, two, three kids and, and she's just at a loss, you know, my thing is, you know, I haven't got the money to support you. I'll help you what I can, but let's see if we can find some agencies, or let's see, you know, what we can do. There are there are places you can go that can help, and they're normally grateful. But on occasion, <laughs> you have to just say no. Yeah. I, and it's hard. And it's I want to believe that everybody's in their heart, and that you know they'll be grateful for whatever anybody does to them, but sometimes they just, you know, they're like, they just see a free meal, or they, and that's putting it lightly, they see a free tank of gas, or they see, you know, and then then it, it, then it is a problem. But that's where you have to depend on the Holy Spirit to say, you know, no, you don't need to do this anymore, or maybe you should help them in another direction. Now, when it comes to Praying and coming to Bible study and to give and to come to church and to do things for others. Those are all good. They are all good. And they are spiritual blessings when done in Christ. Okay? And of course, when we choose to skip a Bible study or a church service, Sometimes we miss the very blessings that God wants to give us. That's not God's fault. That's ours. Okay? Now, that's not a works-based trip I'm talking about here. And I know I kind of harp on this a little bit, but I like the blessings that you really need are in God's Word. The blessings that you really need are here at Father's Arms Fellowship on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night. The blessings that you really need are in Christ and not in Pastor Kidd or Pastor Nancy or Pastor Greg or anybody else. Sometimes we equate blessings, and we brought up a good point, with financial needs. But if we were really honest, if we were really honest, some of the best blessings that we have received in Jesus had nothing to do with cash or food. Oh, well, yeah. you know, sure. uh, being able to uh, a good example when we sent Miss Kay off to Florida we all just gathered around and uh, and just laid hands on her and prayed for her I remember when uh, when the little Karen and uh, and Miss Kay were in the hospital at the same time, and Pastor Kay asked me to go visit them. And the Holy Spirit said, "Take communion." <laughs> and so, because we are we are we used enough wisdom to buy some of those little cups yeah. with the stuff in it, and just to be able to give, you know, Karen and Mary communion. They hadn't had it. 
And Miss K, either she had experienced the Lord's Supper and no telling how long. What a blessing. Yeah. You know, those little <laughs> cups are about a dollar a piece or something like that. They're very minimal in cost. A lot cheaper than that. But, and like I said, yeah. I, I, you know, yeah. but the blessings, the blessings that come from just ministering to people in the smallest, simplest ways are the most awesome things. Just touching people. Let's just touch them. Yeah, yeah. Touch them. And, 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 and so, in a way, by learning some of the deep things, when we do the simple things, that just makes it that much more special. Yes. So, a journey into a spirit into spirit filled living, it requires that we remember who we are, saints in Christ, whom God wants to bless with all spiritual blessings. And then the second thing we need to remember, and we're getting there, is whose we are. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, now we're getting into a subject that we could go on for months. <laughs> With no answers. So I'm going to try to make this as simple as I can. And not get into a deep theological discussion. Because I don't think it's necessary. Okay. God chose us. To him. Before the world was even created. Now. Why me? Don't know. Am I grateful? Yeah. You bet. I, you know, I still don't understand it. Paul puts it like this: According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Do you realize that even before this earth was ever created, He knew you before you were in the womb. He knew you, and He chose you to be His, despite the fact that I'm not the most likable human being in the world. Despite the fact that I'm a huge, nasty, rotten sinner deserving hell. He loved me anyway. Amen. Thank you. Do I get it? The minute I think I do, I'm not so sure. But it's okay. The phrase, He has chosen us, refers to the doctrine of election. That runs throughout the Bible. You've been elected in Christ Jesus. Do I totally understand it? No. Now, when I went to seminary, it was all about Calvinism. That's a fancy word for we think we're, we're way smarter than you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess. I mean, apparently, at every seminary, there are some guys who, and women, who think they're all that. When we went to seminary in Kansas City, uh, Calvinism was a big doctrine that the Southern Baptists were going through at the time, and they're, they're starting to reap some of the fruit of that, and it's not good. And basically, there was a bunch of men that came up from a school in Florida just to that seminary, Middle Western Seminary in Kansas City, and I mean, they had an attitude. That's the only way I could describe it. Now, you know, I love them to this day. But I'm like, the first thing that we go to this church that our pastor, Pastor Lee Holland, had gone to in Kansas City the first Sunday. And one of those guys come up to me and says, I will not preach at a church that doesn't have Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night services. And I was sitting there thinking, you're an idiot. <coughs> Because God may very well send you out in the country, a farm church, where you'll be lucky to get them on Sunday morning. No, he sent us. Because <laughs> we were crazy enough to go to the country. You know? But I'm sitting there thinking, oh, so you're going to tell God what you're going to do. Yeah. And I'm like, mm, good luck with that. That's not good capitalism. Well, you know, like I said, for, for all those of us that have studied some of this stuff, it, it gets a little nuts, and I don't want to get there. But the doc, doctrine of election runs throughout the Scriptures. All right. 
it begins when God chose Abraham's and his descendants to be his chosen people. Okay? Our salvation began in eternity past before the foundation of the world. <coughs> Willie Nelson had a, had a song entitled Always on My Mind, right? Well, according to the scripture, even before the foundation of the world, you were on God's mind. Amen. That's pretty cool. Now, do I claim to understand it and know it? Not a chance. I try. I try. I really try. But what? But because He chose us, it means we can do nothing to earn our salvation. That I do understand. Because it's completely the result of God's choice and His grace. How do I know? Look at John 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I selected you so that you would go and produce fruit, and your fruit would remain, and the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. God's sovereignty in choosing us and our responsibility in accepting that free gift, it seems quite contradictory. That's called an antinomy. A contradictory and a logical conclusion caused by two apparent correct statements or facts. Hmm. Bottom line is, our finite minds cannot understand the antinomies of God. That is the bottom line. So when God says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And if we're not careful, we'll compromise one truth while trying to explain another. Yep. Therefore, we need to accept both truths and let God handle it. Kim said it to me the best. She said, "This, you know, it's in there for a reason, but it's not the main reason. The main reason is Jesus Christ, and that's what makes that's what makes it for me. Because God's ways are our ways. Look what 1 Corinthians says. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. The scripture also says, God chose us and predestined us unto the adoptions of children. The word translated predestined is perusius, and it means marked out beforehand. So in other words, you're in here, you've been marked out beforehand by God. God. That's what it says. Yes, Kim? Well, or you can go to uh, Jeremiah 1 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Yeah. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. So he marked out everything, our path. Now it's up to us to choose that path. Right. I like what Tommy Heigel says here. All right. He says, predestination seems to refer to what? God does for his elect. Election seems to refer to the who, which is the people, and predestination to the what. That's a pretty cool way to explain it. Chuck Missler kind of explained he kind of explained it like this. He said, he said, because God is outside of time and space. And we talked about this in Genesis about the, the all the dimensions. Because God is outside time and space, and because God does not need time, because he is time, basically. He looked outside. He knew who was going to do it. He knew who was going to accept it. So he predestined them to be conformed to his image. I'm just, I've always taught God knows the end from the beginning. He knows. He knows over all the time. He knows who will follow him. By the fact that he sees the hearts of man. Mm -hmm. So that is more not like he randomly picking us. He knows who will follow. Exactly. And you know how Chuck Missler explained it? He explained it like this. He says, okay, when you go, um, if we go to a parade and you're standing, say, in the very middle of the parade, okay, you see the parade coming from point A and then it goes all the way to point, you know, to the end. We see it from the beginning to the end. God is like a giant helicopter. He looks and he sees it all. 
So he knows exactly, like you said, who's because he knows the hearts of man. He knows who's going to do it, and for those he's chosen. One way I say there's a hundred people, and they're all someone passed the basket around. He had a hat of blue rock and a white rock in it. Everybody could choose what they wanted. Well, God knew if he was outside of time. He knew what everyone drew. Now, did he predestine that they, that, that they would draw? When, it, when he said there would be this many with the blue and this many with the right, white, did he predestine that they would pick that rock or did he know by the fact that he knows I tend to think you're. I tend tend to think that way. That's where that's where uh, the Calvinism doctrine is kind of messed up because because basically it's almost like they say you know you know the the, the quote unquote joke is you're part of the frozen chosen. Well, right now it's cold outside, and I think we're all froze. Yeah. Um, but just just beyond that. Yes, you know, we are all totally depraved. Total depravity, number one. Yeah, we're all messed up. You know, but the thing about it is, why are we worried about this? To be honest, why are we all worried about it? Am I part of the chosen or not? If you're here, at this very point, you're part of the chosen because you're pursuing God with, the, with your heart and your mind, wanting to know more about God. Yes. Don't worry about the things that are. Don't try to make overcomplicate things, and that's the point. The enemy will try to overcomplicate things, even religious things, yes. Yes. to to mess our minds up and to turn oh, us yes. away. I mean, that's kind of where I was for a long yeah. time. I'm like, you, you know, I'm like, well, for one, I'll never be like these guys. Thank God. I Thank God. If you're chosen. Deep down, you know you're chosen. You, you've got a, a pulling in the direction that God wants you to go to feel his pull. Correct. And that's part, and, and, and that was predetermined before you were even born yeah. in the womb. Yeah. Because God already knew. Yeah. And that's, and see, and that's the whole thing. And, and the thing about it is, instead of sitting there and arguing over and over about silly points that don't mean a whole lot, I mean, they do, but they don't. I mean, why worry about this stuff? It's, exactly. it's to be honest with you, you know. I thank God that He chose me every day. You know, thank you, Lord, for that. Do I understand it? No. Am I pursuing you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength most days? You know, and the fact that He loves me despite the fact that I struggle is much more important. Than to know all the ins and outs of things that don't really that that are important but not life saving. Well, I think very much that's why he created us in a family type system. Uh, we have a father and mother; they give birth to children. Uh, in reality, it goes all the way back to Colossians one seventeen. Everything created by him for him and neatly held together in him. We've got to understand that we came from him. We are. We're, we're a part of our Father. Every human being that has a spirit manifested within me came from him. Okay. Yeah. He hurts and he feels pain every time oh, one of them lies. And he looks at us just like children, just like you look at your children, and you just like you struggle struggle with your son. We, we struggle in prayer for hours. And so that in the reason he made that family unit so that we would understand you're not that that the and that's the and whole you're going. behind all of us. And you know, with him being all knowing, yes, uh, <clears throat> yes, and there's nothing for him when he knows the end. Because Colossians says everything is kind of completion in him. He is the end of it. He is the beginning. It's what he meant when he said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. So everything's been restored back to him. Uh, you know, uh, and that's tough. You know, his, you know his heart has to ache with the loss of those that don't accept him. 
Oh, you know it. You know, just walk away from it. Just like our heart aches for our own children. You know, and the, and the ultimate manifestation of that is in Revelation at the great white throne judgment. And he watched his first child yeah. walk away from it. But his second one is coming to be with all. Look at what great love he has. He was willing to sacrifice the one he loved them all. Hallelujah. Yeah. Okay, we get into God's family by being born again. All right, we know that. The result of God's election and predestination is that we are adopted as his children. Do you realize that adoption was a Roman function, not a Jewish function? And there's nowhere in the scripture that once you're adopted, you could be unadopted. That should give us eternal security right there. It's not there. Now, some people believe a little differently, and that's fine. We'll just explain it to them on the way up, won't we? Amen. Amen. Our spiritual adoption occurs when God gives us, who are born again, immediate adult status in the family so that we can receive our spiritual inheritance. So therefore, in Christ, new Christians are immediately entitled to all the benefits of heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, also, when somebody, when the doctor you could, and you said this, uh, disinherit a child. You just, your natural child, you know, you're no longer my child. It was illegal to do that to an adopted child. Yeah. And they, uh, they had all the rights of a child, and as a matter of fact, they were held a little higher than your natural children because you were chosen. That's a good point. Yeah. That's cool. All right, so guess what? Since if you're a born-again believer, you are immediately entitled to all the benefits of heaven. Hallelujah. All right, we don't have to wait for a spiritual adulthood to begin living the spirit-filled life. Praise God, because we have way too many spiritual kitties that need to be adults and act like adults. Do we not, Brother Ken? Yes, we got a witness there. All right, beginning a journey into a spiritual living requires that we remember who we are, whose we are, and why we are here. We're about done. We need to remember why God chose us, predestined us, and adopted us. He did these things so that we could be holy and without blame before Him, according to Ephesians chapter 1, the last part of verse 4. It refers to moral excellence because God chose us to reflect His nature. First Peter, First Peter 1.15 gives us this command. It says, But just as he who called you holy is holy, you yourselves also be holy in all of your behavior. Be ye holy as I am holy. Pursue it. Be like the Father. Be like the Father who adopted you. Little kids always want to emulate their parents. Don't they? We want to be like our dad. Now, I don't know what that's like. Because I really didn't have a dad until really I was like 12. By then, it was almost too late. So, you know, I just figured it out along the way. And trust me, I'm definitely not like the TV dads we see. Right? But being holy means we are set apart from sin to be used by God in this world. Without blame. That word is a monos. And it means without blemish or fault. God chose us, predestined us, and adopted us all to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He may, hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Despite the fact that we're wicked sinners, deserving of a hell, deserving of hell, when He adopted us, chose us, predestined us, and all that other stuff, He's made us holy, clothed in His righteousness. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. This means our salvation is solely because of God's grace, which is exclusively available in Christ, the beloved. And we should praise His glorious grace because of what John 1.16 says. And of His fullness have we all received and grace for grace. Amen. So, 
As we begin this journey into a spiritual life, it requires that one, we remember who we are, whose we are, and why we're here. Amen. Y'all ready for some good stuff? Yeah. All right, Father, thank you. Thank you. A lot of, a lot of stuff to chew on here. But the bottom line is we're in you. Thank you. And you see us with your righteousness. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Next week, folks.